Hello, this is City Council Spotlight today with at-large counselor Jake Wilson. I'm Sarah Fishman. How are you doing, Jake? Great, Sarah. Thanks. How are you? I'm good. I see you have all of Somerville behind you. Appropriate for an at-large counselor. I think so. I think so. So since you are uh, newly elected as of November, if you could just give a short bio, some professional, some personal, just couple of things so we know more about you. Absolutely. Yeah, I was uh, born in the Twin Cities. I grew up on a farm in Iowa. I came out east for college at Penn in Philadelphia. Uh, after graduating from there in 99, my partner and I moved up here to the area. We lived in Brighton for five years while she got her PhD from Boston College. And we moved to Somerville in 2004. And we've lived on Jake Street for the past 18 years. We have two daughters, uh, seven and 10, who are uh, in the public schools at uh, the Healy School just down the street from us. And we're, we're loving life in Somerville. Uh, my professional background, I did some consulting and advisory services after college, and I pivoted to uh, journalism and communications work after the dot-com crash. And I worked for Major League Baseball, uh, MLB.com specifically for 12 years uh, before it's running. That, what, did that, what does that mean? What did you uh, do? Which part? The MLB.com. I'm trying to figure out what you did. Oh, so I was an editorial producer for Major League Baseball's uh, media website, MLB.com. Huh, interesting. I was specifically in charge of social media there and even more specifically their blogging platform. Um, so yeah, it was uh, for me, it was an intersection of natural interests, social media, and being a huge baseball fan. Uh, it was uh, surreal to work in a sport uh, that I'd followed so closely all my life. That's cool. All right, and now well, I work for the people of Somerville. Yes. Okay. So now let's get a little more concrete in your duties here. Um, so you are chair of the finance committee and you are one of four at-large candidates of which only one is an incumbent who is now serving her first full term. So how does someone take on that responsibility as a new counselor. And more generally, how hard or easy has it been for you to step up? Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. It's a, it's a lot to learn. Uh, the learning curve is pretty steep. Everything from just the procedural stuff like uh, the rules of the city council and how, how meetings function, uh, remembering to say through the chair uh, for everything. Uh, but yeah, as you get more comfortable with that, you definitely, you, you pick that stuff up pretty quickly. It, it's the, the thing now that I'm mostly spending a lot of time on is, is just trying to soak up like a sponge, all the different, you know, the, there's so many areas uh, the, of policy that you have to know about to do this job and making sure that I'm fully up to speed on those. Uh, that, that's generally how I spend my, my days and nights at this point, other than, you know, the official duties. Uh, it's just really important for me to, I want to know uh, very, very intimately what I am making policy about and voting on. Uh, it's, it, I'm just not comfortable voting on things that I don't know all about. And so I'm really driven to, come, to just come up to speed fully on pretty much everything involved in, uh, you know, everything from municipal finance to, uh, uh, you know, ordinances around uh, some of the stuff with our streets. So I, I I cannot believe the level of detail that you go into. I have done these interviews for a long time and I always, well, more recently, send messages to people ahead of time. And you are the only one who has ever responded with anything really specific and more than one thing. So uh, maybe you're just a really good detail kind of guy, but I'm gonna, so, we can't go through everything, but what I'd like you to do briefly is, if you could, you said you made a budget list and you said you this was a new thing. So if you could explain what that is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, you know, it was important to me. So what happened was the administration came to us and this was great. They asked for counselors, individual budget priorities for fiscal year 2023. So is that, awesome. has that not been done before? Not officially, to my knowledge, not any sort of official process. And so I, I, there were opportunities for counselors to weigh in, but it, this brought some formality to it. 
Mm-hmm. And what I did then was I thought we can, we can do you one better. We can, uh, you know, and this was my belief that we could, we could figure out a process where we could distill down and, and arrive at some, uh, some, some areas of agreement on the city council and identify our shared budget priorities as a council. I felt that that was really powerful to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, not just because it would remind us of all the areas of agreement that we do have, you know, in politics, I feel like areas of disagreement tend to be magnified. Mm-hmm. And I'm someone who looks to to build consensus and, and uh, you know, it, it's sort of a, I liken it to the agile development approach where you identify uh, you know, quick, easy wins right from the start. And you go for that, you know, identify the areas we agree on. Low hanging fruit. The low hanging fruit, exactly. And then you reassess, you know, okay, we've got this done. Where are we at now? And we were able to do that. Uh, what we did was we basically accumulated 179 individual budget priority resolutions from city councilors. And then on March 30th, we held a uh, meeting of the whole, uh, committee of the whole meeting for the finance committee. And we were able to identify out of that 10 shared budget priorities for the city council for next fiscal year and communicate that to the administration. And I think that's particularly important because otherwise the administration might be left guessing where colleagues were, my colleagues and I were at on certain things. This makes it very clear uh, Mm -hmm. what we agree on. We passed these these resolutions. I believe they were all passed 11-0. So we, we are speaking with a unified voice this is what your city council wants to see in next year's budget. Wow, that's great. Um, uh, I will say it was not without problems. Uh, Gremlins, you know, uh, we had a last minute exposure to COVID that required us to go to a hybrid approach. Literally, we found out at four o'clock uh, before a six o'clock start. And, you know, I was thankful for the the scrambling that the, the staff did. You had, to, you had to do that. I mean... It, it was it was critical for me, given what we were doing. It was it was absolutely critical for me that uh, all eleven of us had a voice there. There was yeah. some thought that we might have to soldier on with just ten of us, and I was committed to making sure that all eleven of us had a voice in this process. I'd put in too much. I I'd put in the work, and my colleagues had put in too much work to see this. You no, know it sounds like a baseball all. lineup, making sure that your bench is deep enough. Um, absolutely. Okay, so. What had oh, that actually raises a question which I was curious about. Do you have any sense of when the city council um, meetings are going to start to be in person? Because it is really hard to follow these things online. Well, our our full meetings are in person now. Uh, they've been in oh, person they are? Since, since March. Uh, the city council meetings are the regular that. meetings. Committee meetings generally still are virtual. Um, we did do a finance committee of the whole in person for the budget uh, priority thing that I just discussed. Uh, confirmation of appointments did one in person meeting as well. I thought um, I asked this before, but maybe I asked it of the school committee, not of the council. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, I, personally, I'm much more at ease in person. It's just to me, to me it makes a lot more sense just mm-hmm. talking directly to people in the same room. And I'll, and I'll be honest, as a chair of the finance committee the upside to doing these things in person is as a chair, you're sort of oftentimes trying to gauge intent of people and where people are at on it. And you can read body language so much more easily in person, but at the same time, you know, we've been in a pandemic and, you know, some things are more important than the ease of, you know, gauging where people are at. Okay. So that actually is a perfect segue into what I was going to ask you next, which is mask mandates being dropped. So, now, before, if like a res- restaurant or small businesses, the city had control over that. But the T, not having a mask mandate. Now, on- online, on your newsletter, your blog, you're wearing a mask, which I thought was really cool. It's sort of like Batman-like because it wasn't really necessary. <laughs> but what, what do you think about that? I mean, have you gone on the T? Have you, if you have, have you worn one? Do you have yes any thoughts yes. on this? Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so to me, and, and the, the reality is those were campaign photos taken during, you know, when masks, there was, a, there, I think there was actually a citywide mask mandate even out your photo. at that point. Well, you know what, I've intentionally not done that because, uh, you know, we are still in a pandemic. I know Dr. Fauci weighed in yesterday and said that maybe, uh, you know, America was, was out of a pandemic and into, you know, and it had gone endemic, but globally, we're still in a pandemic. 
Yeah. And I'll tell you, I'm following the wastewater COVID signal data really closely. I check those numbers on a daily basis. It's a leading indicator of what's to come in terms of our COVID numbers. It did uh, trend downward last week, sort of surprisingly, but as mm -hmm. people pointed out, that was April vacation week and families were gone. You know, But then the numbers continued to trend down this week, even after everyone was back. So that's encouraging, but you know, by no means are we, are we anywhere close to out of the woods. The mm -hmm. thing about masks that I really want to make a point about is there's a lot of nuance around when they're effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, people tend to hate nuance. People like simple black and white uh, yeah. explanations. But the science is very, very clear on masks that a proper fitting N95 or KN95 or KF94 mask reduces transmission overall. It, what it does is it buys mask wearers and those around them some time. Um, the real benefits, you see it in fleeting encounters on the T, as you mentioned, in a crowd, at the grocery store, at a pharmacy. Um, that's when it really pays dividends. Uh, because most masks aren't properly fitted, the reality is that, you know, if you're sitting in an office next to the same person all day long, or if you're in a school classroom, you're getting extended exposure, the mask is generally not going to do as much in those situations. But, you know, on the T, yeah, that's why it was tough seeing the T's mask mandate be dropped. Like that's exactly the kind of place that we want to be seeing that. And they could have, they could have said, well, we don't care what the CDC says. We don't care what yeah. the federal government says. Yeah. I mean, it, not, it might have been not expected, but it was certainly possible that they could have said, we're maintaining this policy for now. And, so. and I get it. Wearing a mask is not fun. Your ears can hurt a little after, but whatever, you know, like some things are more important than fun. And I'll tell you, I wear a mask in most indoor settings now because I want to model healthy, responsible behavior, especially when I'm in Somerville. I do feel that responsibility as an elected official. Uh, my Good family sure. all had Omicron BA1 at the beginning of the year. So, you know, we, oh. yeah, we did have some immunity from that. We took advantage of, we didn't cut loose, but we went out to Southern California. We went to Disneyland as a family. Uh, but that immunity does start to wane. The science is clear on this. After about 90 days, your immunity starts to wane. So, you know, I'm no longer, uh, you know, I'm past that personally. So uh, I could catch BA2 again, you know. And so I'm also, it's not just about modeling behavior. Like I actually do want to safeguard my health and the health of my family as do you, well. Do, do your children wear masks at school? Uh, they do. I leave it up to them. They do sometimes in some situations. Uh, I believe it's important. To, they understand all of this and I believe it's important to let kids make decisions. So I, I do trust them with that decision personally. I don't, I, I don't know what they do all day long. I do see them wearing masks out of the building oh, and into it. Um, you know, but I, I do believe it's important to give our kids agency and, and, uh, uh, independence. How old are they? Seven and 10. Okay. All right. So now we're going to segue to the T and to the Union Square T, because you were also the first city councilor I'm talking to after the Union Square station has opened. Um, have you been on, have you been to the station or on there and gone to Leachmere and back or something? Absolutely, I was there opening day. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was a simultaneously, a, you know, a, a really celebratory occasion, but also, you know, right there, you know, we had a lot of mixed feelings about it as, as my colleague from, from Ward 3 Council Union Camp had pointed out. Uh, it can be a celebration of an achievement of significant expansion of public transit, and it can be a reminder of the real damage that's been caused by the rise in housing costs and a threat of what's still to come there. Both of those can be true. Yeah. So there's this one really tall building. It looks like it's 10 to 12 stories to me. And that's a lot of it is done. And then there seems to be another slightly shorter building that's that's going up. And I know tons and tons of time was spent on this and that there was a big plan with the developers and a lot of give and take, but a city councilor, I can't remember the exact words, so I'm not going to say who said it, but it was something along the lines of, well, we didn't think it would come out this way, which I thought was saying um, that the the degree of development was larger or more imposing than expected. So do you have any sense of that, uh, a, an opinion on that? I mean, we, uh, I assume we're talking about height when we talk about degree of development. Well, as not well. just height, but, but density, because 
you, you create these valleys. You know, if you ever go to New York City, you know, you create these valleys in between tall buildings. So it's not just the, the mass on the ground, it's the whole space. Um, and then you're pushing out mom and pop businesses and you're, you're, you're changing the whole, you're gentrifying potentially, you're, you're changing the, the whole thing, so. Yeah, so, I mean, I see those are, there are two separate issues there, right? There's redevelopment and mm -hmm. that's the whole thing. During the campaign, I talked extensively about the need for equitable <laughs> redevelopment, making sure that we aren't redeveloping at the expense of, yes, local businesses, immigrant owned businesses, women owned businesses, uh, union in particular, you know, I, I know a lot of the businesses there, which did tend to be uh, women and, and immigrant owned over the years have been, you know, that's where we're seeing people forced out. Uh, and that's what really alarms me. You know, uh, I'm, How can I'm that good with, I'm good with redevelopment. It has to happen equitably. And I've talked to economic development about this. And I was heartened to hear like Davis Square, for example, uh, where there's some redevelopment going on. Um, you know, at the Davis Square Plaza, uh, Asana's the developer there. And there was, understandably, there was some real apprehension about that particular developer, given their involvement in Harvard Square and what happened there with the mom and pop businesses. I saw that play out. I spent, I used to spend a lot of time in Harvard Square. Mm -hmm. I don't so much anymore. A lot of the places I love to go to are gone. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, I'm sorry, everything cannot be a chain store or a bank. Uh, that does not, that's not a, a shopping district that people want to go to necessarily. Uh, people, well, it's people, a mall potentially. It's, outdoor, it's, yeah, basically an outdoor mall. You know, we can do better than that. We mm -hmm. need to make sure Davis does not turn out like that. So I was really heartened to hear that I think at this point, all but one of the impacted businesses have been temporarily or permanently relocated um, in, in uh, the Davis Square Plaza project there. Uh, I think seven mm -hmm. spoke is what they're calling it. In, uh, in the Davis Square area or elsewhere in the city? In or? Davis Square for this specific, uh, for this specific uh, project. Okay. Yeah, and, and so what you point out then with, with union, um, it, it's this paradox, you know, it's a little counterintuitive where, you know, we are the most densely populated city in New England, and then here you have us clamoring for what? More density. Uh, mm -hmm. But the reality is we were the most densely populated city in New England without good public transit, but we're, ha that, we're getting that now. And that's when we wanna see high density transit oriented development happening. So, you know, yeah, the, the scale of that one building, you know, right there, I forget the exact address, but the one, the tall one that was the giant elevator shaft for a long time, that mm. can, you know, that can be a little startling to people. Um, you know, it does, it is going to stand out in our city. It's taller than most everything else, but you know, I'm of the belief, like we need, that's what we need is, is density, especially right there at transit hubs, like, like union. All right. So I'm going to, I wanted, we wanted to talk about so many other things, but I want to skip to um, street safety because this is something you've, you've also talked about. Um, so the, there's this slogan, 20 is plenty. Can you explain that and how feasible it is? Yeah, I mean, so just in general, like the, the issue of, of safe streets, that's a personal one for me. I'm motivated to make streets safe for me and my family to bike and, and walk around the city. Uh, my aim is to reduce my own personal car trips around the city. And I'm a firm believer that walking around one city should not be a high risk activity. Uh, we've seen numerous pedestrian deaths in recent years. And, and, and as a reason, you know, that's why of the orders I put in 13 of them uh, that I've either introduced or, or co-signed uh, were safe streets orders so far in the first four months. Uh, you mentioned 20 is plenty. Uh, that's a big one. If you look at the stats on survivability of, of crashes with pedestrians, um, it gets, you know, it, it's scary in general. It gets really bleak as you go north of 20 miles an hour. Uh, the goal is to slow people down. It also has a, a great knock-on effect where um, it will disincentivize uh, navigation apps like Waze and, and Google Maps to send commuter cut-through traffic through our city if their algorithms are picking up that it's slower to go through the city than to stay on the highways. So for me, that's, uh, you know, that's intersectional. And yeah. it, it's, you know, there's a reason why I have 20 is plenty, you know, in my Twitter bio. Uh, I will tell you, I've personally become a much slower driver as I've become more aware of these things. Mm -hmm. And I, it's good for my mental health. Like I arrive at my destination 
in a better mood. You don't feel like you're in, you know, part of some rat race anymore out there. It takes the competitive uh, stress out of driving that people tend to feel. And I'd recommend it to anyone to, to slow it down. Um, you know, and that's why it's an important part of, of, you know, what I'm trying to do at the city council level, along with daylighting, general traffic, calming bike lanes, reducing cut through traffic, school streets, uh, which is closing streets right, right around schools, uh, and then just a general embrace of enforcement. Now, I think you said that the reducing the rate from 25 to 20 miles an hour citywide would require a lot of signage change. Yeah, um, that's accurate. So is that both money and time? And It is, it is. And is there some uh, intermediate step that could be taken? Like you put stickers on certain signs that say, can't go through during rush hour. Now I know there's enforcement issues, but if you sort of targeted some of the worst places, so to speak, and, and then did other things in some of the quote unquote worst places, um, former Ward 5 um, counselor, Mark Niedergang, my counselor and neighbor, um, he, he thought that the intersection of Lowell and Albion was really bad. And there are now five speed humps along Lowell. You cannot go more than 20 miles an hour. You have to go less than that unless you want your muffler to fall. So, you know, has there been, or will there be any of that kind of planning, you know, sort of targeting certain areas? Absolutely. Uh, I can tell you, so what, you, what you're describing on Lowell there, and we also saw it on Morrison, that reflects a real uptick in the bandwidth uh, of our city to put more speed humps in. Basically, they've figured out processes. Uh, it's a coordinated process. There's the actual you know, infrastructure piece of building the actual speed hump. There's also then marking and signage and all that. And those have to be coordinated. Otherwise you end up with a potentially unsafe situation where there's an unmarked speed hump and someone driving at night rips out the bottom of their car on it. Right. So it's really important that those be done in concert. Um, and the good news is uh, mobility. I know this from speaking to Director Ross and mobility. They're feeling increasingly confident about their ability to do this and they're expanding that program. Uh, I was the co-sponsor. Uh, I moved, so like I said, I moved to Jake Street in 2004. We've been yelling at uh, different iterations of aldermen and city councilors for speed humps on our street. My neighbors and I have been since 2004. And I'm delighted uh, to hear, in the, it came out in the, on Monday's uh, traffic and parking committee meeting that Jake Street is getting speed humps. Uh, that, that is a roller coaster of a road. How can people, I mean, maybe they go down fast, but you can't go fast up there unless you wanna like, take off to Logan or something. I don't, I mean, it's- Jake Street? Yeah. Oh, you'd be surprised. People do 40 down this street very frequently. Oh, it's okay. a straightaway, you know, right. it's we a country. We don't have a lot of other time. I, I, I gotta ask you, this is a serious issue, but I did not know that there was a difference. Do you know the difference between a speed hump and a speed bump? Speed humps are broader, I believe. That's my that's my understanding. It's a broader, more like a mini traffic calming table, whereas speed humps are smaller and a little more, you know. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. the the humps correct. The the humps are longer and shorter and on roadways. The bumps, um, I'm sorry. The 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 humps are longer but not as high yeah. and on roads. The bumps are are not as long but tend to be higher and are mainly in parking lots. Right. Okay. So that's why I, I try to be precise with my terminology and say yeah. speed. Level. I couldn't believe. So anyway, um, is, so I almost wish there were some sort of, um, you know, charrette kind of exercise where you had all these different people come. I know some of this has ha already happened, but you put up scenarios. There's a biker here. There's a car there. There's a woman with a baby carriage. Who has right of way? What does person A have to do? What does person B have to do? What if, what does person C, if they're being polite, do? Is is that kind of thing even useful uh, or not? I mean, it's it, I mean, what you just touched on there is you know it's at the heart of it. Like as soon as you start, like basically we have these three constituencies, right? Uh, vehicle traffic, cyclists, and pedestrians all trying to use or get across or navigate our roads and streets and you know 
it's it oftentimes you'll hear one group complaining about the other the reality is everyone needs this needs to be symbiotic right uh, that's 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 my point it seems yeah. like there is a general um lack of courtesy or lack of understanding or some combination of the two um i was once walking on on the bike path there were these four teenage boys way taller than me and one of them noticed and said move away to his friends. That's happened to me once. And I've lived here since way before the bike path. So um, you, but you, you bike, but you will avoid the big streets. Is that right? You said that somewhere? Yeah. I mean, so most of my biking, honestly, around here tends to, to happen uh, on bike paths and, and bike ways. I'm, I'm a big fan of the, the uh, like the, everything from the Minuteman to, I, I'm really excited about these bike basically mm -hmm. the connections that are happening right now with these bike paths like you'll be able i live very close to the blessing bay boathouse uh on the mystic there and you'll you'll very soon be be able to go from there into boston uh via charlestown out to out to the sea out to nahant and lynn on the the bike to the sea path up to the mystic lakes uh out on you know to the to the minute man and out to belmont uh all all without having to mix with cars and i think that's pretty amazing yeah. And the mayor does not own a car, does she? That's that's accurate. The mayor does not. I have seen the mayor and her daughter going to out of town soccer uh, practices and games by bike. And I think that's pretty awesome. Unbelievable. And she also has an elderly uh, father living with her, I think, or used to. Yeah. All right. So um, don't have a whole lot of time left. Let's. Um, Maybe I'll I'll go back to some. Don't I, we can't focus on it as much as I wish to. But very quickly, uh, affordable housing fixes. What does it mean that the eviction moratorium was extended until June thirtieth? Well, that, first of all, it means it means that some good is going to happen because there are some very recent programs that have been created, and and the whole point of this was to buy some time uh, for these programs to do their thing. Uh, you know, it, it was very clear that this is being sunsetted on June 30th. So, you know, those who are worried about this being, you know, kicking the can down the road and just a, you know, <laughs> indefinite extension. That's not the case. Like this is clearly being sunsetted. Uh, but we can't keep an eviction moratorium forever. Uh, no one is, no one is saying that. Uh, but what it, what it is going to do is it's going to buy time to basically give people access to these programs that can go back and, and look to, to pay back some of that back rent that's due that might be resulting in evictions, it should decrease the number of evictions here, uh, which is good for everyone. You know, it's good for, for tenants who don't, won't have to find a new place to live. It's good for landlords who will be made whole uh, because the reality is they're far more likely to, to be made whole through this process than they would be from any sort of, uh, you know, involvement of the courts. Uh, it's just a fact of life. You know, this is, a, this is the better, you know, better avenue to, uh, to get everyone made whole and to do right by everyone. Well, on that positive note, we need to end. Um, I know we're gonna put up some links for how people can reach you, uh, but do you have any announcements or anything upcoming meeting that you want people to know about? Well, I mean, I'll just throw out there, I do a, a weekly group office hours on Sunday mornings. Right now it's via Zoom, but we're gonna be looking to go in person uh, outdoors uh, at settings uh, rotating around our, our fine city. And I always offer on-demand uh, office hours, either in person or virtually. I have a Calendly app that lets people basically uh, directly claim time that's available on my calendar uh, that works for them. And I do a weekly newsletter that uh, seems to be going over decently well with, with, the, with the city and that people can subscribe at my website, uh, jakeforsomerville.org. Okay, so we, we have to stop there, but thank you so much. This has been City Council Spotlight. Have a good day. Thank you.